Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to, you to our class, Reinforcement Learning, um, in the summer term 2023. Uh, so welcome you to our first lecture today. Um, my name is Oliver Waldscheid. I will be hosting most of the lectures, except two. And uh, we are going to meet here for the next roughly 15 appointments to have uh, a very nice course on the basics of reinforcement learning, first applied to rather simple problems in the so-called tabular case, and then later on we will also handle deep reinforcement learning topics, but what we're going to discuss in this class we will see also later. Today we will going to have uh, basically a double lecture or more like two times, not a full lecture, but maybe two times 60 minutes with a break of 15 minutes in between, uh, and exercises then will start from next week on. So today we go to have like 60 minutes and a little break and then to continue with the first introductory lecture today. The lecture, uh, lecture today will be structured basically in uh, six parts. Um, so we will just start with a little basic uh, administrative stuff regarding the course framework. Then we're going to discuss reinforcement learning. What is that in terms of a very general statements of what reinforcement learning can be considered. Then we're going to discuss yeah, just an example, one or two, and also some historical background where reinforcement learning is basically originating from. And then as a main part, we're going to discuss basic terminologies, so basic, basically definitions uh, of important conceptual objects, uh, which we're going to discuss throughout the entire lecture course. And some main categories of reinforcement learning, which we will, of course, today just discuss on a very high level and then feed in details during the upcoming weeks. And then last but not least, as we will have um, in our application examples and exercises, we will have a very strong connection to many control engineering kind of problems. In that sense, we will also going to have a small comparison to model predictive control, where we will see that many things are similar here between model predictive control and reinforcement learning. So let me start with the course framework today. Um, so I will not give this course alone. Uh, we will basically uh, have a strong team here together in total seven persons. Uh, Barney, Darius, Wilhelm, Marvin, Max, Daniel and myself. Uh, we are going to host the entire uh, course. Um, so most of them will support me during the exercises, as said, starting from next week. But uh, we will also see that at least uh, Wilhelm and Daniel will give also two lectures while I'm uh, on a business trip, not in Paderborn. So uh, during the different exercises, you will meet these gentlemen. Um, they will show up more or less randomly. So don't be irritated if some of them are here and some are not. Uh, we will get things sorted, um, but yeah. So don't be surprised if every one of them shows randomly up to one of the exercises. In terms of examination, of course, that is always an important question, but it's very simple. Um, in this case, we will have a very straightforward oral examination in this course. So that means that you can have an individual appointment uh, with us as a teaching group. Um, normally, you just request this appointment via email, uh, which would be normally after the class, so in summer, starting mid of July, after the entire course has been delivered. Um, and one oral examination would be roughly around 45 minutes. Oral examination means that we basically have a, a kind of discussion where you will slip into the basically teacher's role, explaining to me concepts, examples, and so on, um, discovering the entire content of the course. And um, as an, let's say, added challenge, but also maybe as an added bonus, you should prepare something before you come to this oral exam, and this will be basically a practical pro programming task. As you will see that many of the uh, exercises which we will do together with you will be based on practical programming. We also would like to see uh, certain skills during the examination. So that means that during the end of the entire course, we will basically upload you uh, a task to ponder, uh, which will be basically on reinforcement learning for uh, complex systems control. And you should uh, prepare a solution for this by methods, which we have get to know in the course. Uh, you should upload your solution uh, beforehand, such that we can scan your code if everything seems to be fine and um, yeah, so on. And then at the beginning also of the oral exam, you should uh, present a little um, yeah, presentation 
in that sense on how did you solve the task, what have been your observations in terms of uh, what has been difficult, what was going easily, uh, to also interpret your results in that sense that you performed very well uh, in your own, uh, yeah, come in. Uh, in your own eyes, or do you identify any things which you could improve, and so uh, like that. So therefore, the oral exam will be basically uh, divided into two parts. We will start with your presentation and maybe have some questions regarding your implementation and your presentation itself. And from there on, the discussion will basically seamlessly, gradually involve towards general discussion of any contents which we have uh, covered during the course. Any questions regarding the examination? Normally there are questions. Yes? Uh, so the question is, can be that, that in German the answer is no. <laughs> in the module handbook we have um, modeled this course completely as English. And to be honest, um, it will be very hard to discuss a course in German because there are hardly any lecture books which handle the topic in German because it's involving so much internationally um, that all the standard technical terms are all in English. And you know, if you just leave out the, the gap words in between, we will, you know, even if we would talk German to each other, it would be like 50% English. So let's stay with English. Okay. Other questions? Uh, one third to th two thirds, right? So this. Uh, presentation and discussion will be roughly 50-20 minutes. So having the entire exam 45 minutes, so that will be roughly the waiting. Um, but yeah, so of course the entire picture counts, right? So um, if you have a very good presentation, for example, this can of course make up for some weaknesses during the uh, later on discussion, but of course the overall grade will be formed by the entire impression consisting out of the presentation of the Q&A based on the presentation uh, because we also want to see of course that you have solved this by your own so that's why we ask questions and see if you really have understood the topic and the task um, and so there will be not like a fixed waiting but you know the entire impression counts. Good? Cool. Um, in contrast also to the previous years there will be no intermediate exams or something so uh, we will have 14 lectures and exercises basically with now bonus tests, pre-examinations and things like that. We have conducted this in the previous semesters, but the feedback from the students was that it's basically too much work and was also not appreciated in that sense that you could obtain bonus points. So that's why we throw it away and so that's it. Um, if you're not happy with this, then give us the contrary feedback this year and then we can decide what we do next year. But this year it will be uh, just an oral exam with this preparation task, uh, practical preparation task, and lectures and exercises. Cool. Good. Um, course outline. So what's going to be discussed during the next 40 weeks will be today conceptual basics and some historical overview. Uh, next week then Markov decision processes. This is basically our problem language which we will use in order to model reinforcement learning based problems. Then we will start solving these problems, first by dynamic programming, which is actually not really reinforcement learning, but uh, basically our classical um, optimization, which is not based on learning, but just on optimizing. But then we will actually go to classical reinforcement learning tools, starting with Monte Carlo learning, temple difference learning, and multi-step bootstrapping. So these will be all uh, single lectures. Then we will again do a little excursion in order to delimit ourselves from methods which are not classically considered reinforcement learning but model-based approaches. Uh, therefore, we have a section on planning and model-based reinforcement learning. Uh, and then from there on, so everything until here will be basically in the so-called tabular case. So tabular case means, we will also discuss it later today, that all important variables which we will work with that these are basically discrete variables so that we work with finite sets which can be stored in tables therefore table or methods they are easily to be handled we can also give some nice guarantees in order to find optimal solutions for these problems 
that uh, the problem is, of course, real world is not like really a discrete world. Um, variables are normally continuous, right? So if I'm standing here or if I'm standing there, there's normally like a continuous distance between these two informations. And therefore, we need to uh, develop ourselves forward to problems which are not discrete but continuous. And for that, we basically need functional approximation. And therefore, from this section on, we will work with really the uh, machine learning kind of approaches where we also combine classical reinforcement learning based approaches with functional approximations like artificial neural networks or similar. Based on that, we will also then evolve to policy gradient method, which is basically the large um, method class of reinforcement learning applied to deep learning problems. Then we will basically uh, stroll around a little bit around temporary reinforcement learning algorithms which have been developed during the last five, six years, which are very famous nowadays and which are used in many, many uh, important applications. And then as a last outlook, basically the last lecture will be on practical issues, which we will basically see in uh, control engineering practice, which is meta learning, so trying to generalize uh, learning concepts and safety. As we will see already today, that reinforcement learning might have some problems with safety and technical systems. Yeah, so as I said, 14 lectures, 14 exercises, and today we are going to start with the conceptual basics and historical overview. Recommended textbooks, you also find them on Pender or these links here. I hope you can see it in the, in the Beamer here. They are it's like a light blue color. So these are links. You can click them also on the slides uh, on the PDFs. Um, there is a famous book from Sutton and Barton in the 2018 version, which is freely available. Um, so this would be our lecture book, which we have based the lecture series most on especially the first part of tabular methods. Then um, also there will be inspiration and also some citations in terms of graphics, which we have took from David Silver uh, from his 2015 lecture series. You can also find the base material here. And for the things which are mostly related to control engineering, there is a book from Dimitri Batsikas, uh, which has also, I think, a YouTube lecture video on it, which is not linked here. Uh, unfortunately, that book is not freely available, but it is still very useful if you want to continue learning in an interconnection between optimal control and reinforcement learning. That would be definitely a very uh, well uh, recommendable book. However, the main focus would be on these first two literature resources, which are available freely uh, for everyone uh, on the internet and also on Panda. Um, speaking of Panda, so um, you already have gotten a message from me via Pandor. Of course, we will use Panda for providing you this exam pre-task, which we have talked about. We will use Panda for everyday communication. So if we have to announce something like you, like, I don't know, we change lecture room, or I don't know if there's something special. Um, or if you have questions, of course, uh, Panda would be also for asynchronous communication, the way to discuss with us. Um, anything except that will be handled on this GitHub repository, which I've already sent around in the email. So all the materials and also lecture video captures, uh, which we will record during the lectures, will be put on, on GitHub with links and YouTube links and so on. So everything which you need in order to learn, um, to work on the exercises and so on, you will basically find there. Okay. Um, and of course, if you have any question at any point of time during the lecture or the exercises, right, so just raise your hand. This should be bidirectional. Um, if there's anything uncertain, if there's anything unclear, you know, just raise your hand and then we will directly discuss here together because as more we are going to discuss bidirectionally, the better. Okay? So this should be not like, you know, a theater show where I'm just talking all the time. I'm also getting tired after 20 minutes and maybe fall asleep or things like that. So don't wake me up in this case. Uh, very important. Um, so therefore, you're cordially invited to just raise your hand if something is unclear. Okay. Um, so this was already the course framework. Not so much administrative stuff. Straight lecture, straight exercise, oral exam. Anything unclear? Administratively. Sounds good? Sounds good. Cool. Then let's go into uh, 
the very basics uh, in terms of what reinforcement learning is. So, reinforcement learning is about this picture. You will see this picture a lot during the next week, so already get used to it now. It will help you to survive the course. Uh, and reinforcement learning is basically running in cycles in this loop. And um, in this picture, you basically already see everything which you also need to know about reinforcement learning. So we could just utilize this picture and we could now talk 14 weeks about it because everything which we will discuss is in this framework of this loop. So uh, this is very central. What we can see basically in this uh, figure already are the central elements of the reinforcement learning loop. We will have an agent. This is basically, I would call it the software component or the solution component, which you will slip into its role. So you will try to find solutions for certain problems. And the agent is the software, the guy which will apply and learn these solutions. Um, coming from a control engineering point of view, this would be basically our controller or controller software. The agent interacts with an environment which is here uh, yeah, presented cartoonically as a maze. The environment can be basically everything. Here it is like cartoonically a maze, so we could like try to solve to go through this maze and find the exit. But it could be any kind of decision-making problem which can be represented by some kind of a model or by a real physical device. So that could be a technical thing like trying to steer an autonomous car, flying an autonomous drone, um, doing process automation in chemical industry, um, trying to move through this classroom as fast as possible. So it could be like really every kind of decision-making problem and to have a common word of this, we call this environment. So environment is basically the thing which we interact with. We will also see some examples more specifically later on. Then between these, there's also the interpreter. We could also call this like sensors or something like that. So this will be a device or array of devices which will basically sense the environment and provide observations, so informations about the environmental state to the agent. So speaking of our autonomous vehicle, um, application that could be information regarding the speed of the vehicle, the position of the vehicle with respect to the street layout and things like that. So any information which is important to give the agent information about its environment, its surrounding. Um, if I want to navigate through this room, this could be the information about where I'm standing currently, what distance I have to the room walls, uh, what speed I have if I move through the room. So anything which we consider uh, inform, uh, informative information. Therefore, we also differentiate here between the state and the observation. We will also see this later. Sometimes the state, which represents the entire information about the environment, might not be fully available to the agent. In that sense, that the observation might be only a part, a subset of the state. For example, uh, let's say you drive your autonomous car and at some point your speed sensor fails, right? Then this information would be not available anymore to the agent because the sensor reading does not arrive. In this case, the state information of the car, of course, the velocity is still an important state information of the car, but this information does not become available to the agent. Then the reward. Uh, this will be discussed, of course, much more deeply also in the uh, following tasks. But the reward is basically an indication how good or how bad the agent will uh, perform in the specific task. So the reward is normally something which is very task specific, right? So uh, in simple words, if your agent which tries to drive the autonomous car is behaving well in the streets, then it would get a rather high reward. And if it's crashing against trees and pedestrians and so on, obviously the reward would be not so good. So this is basically one central quantity, one scalar quantity, where we try to present in metric, in performance metric to the agent, what behavior should be emphasized and what behavior should be avoided, right? So just a performance metric. And this performance, of course, can depend on the specific task. But we will discuss this more deeply. 
And over time, the agent will basically loop through this interaction loop uh, many, many times. We will also consider different kinds of how often we will loop through this problem. And over time, the agent will basically get experience interacting with the environment and with this experience, the agent tries to learn something over time, making better decisions than previously. So at the beginning, when you try to learn how to drive a car, obviously, when yourself have been in the driving school, you maybe made a lot of mistakes, but you obtained experience from driving the car and then you became better and better and better. And that is basically the same for this agent, which we will model as a mathematical program. Okay, so what are then the key um, properties of reinforcement learning? Let's summarize them. In contrast to other machine learning topics, because we will see that reinforcement learning is basically a machine learning pillar, we do not have any supervisor. So there is not like somebody, normally in most cases, at least we will not handle it, somebody which will tell you you have to do it in this and this way. So there will be only somebody which will tell you, okay, if you hit with your car the tree that was bad, I give you a negative reward. But nobody will tell you how in the next time you should drive your car that you do not hit the tree again. So this teacher, the supervisor in the classical reinforcement learning context is not there. So we do not have any solution which we can try to mimic classically but we just have to learn from experiences and mistakes on our own, right? So basically, uh, you are in the driving school, but you do not have a driving teacher. So they give you the car, and then you have to learn it by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting concept, but mathematically, that is what's happening. Um, it is also data-driven, I've mentioned that. So this experience, which I've um, told you already about, we will model this as a mathematical experience tuple, and this experience tuple will be the basic information, the basic data the agent will utilize in order to make better decisions in the future. And this interaction between environment and agent, this is basically an interaction which will lead to continuous data streams which the agent will then utilize in order to improve itself. We will also see that we are working on discrete time steps. Um, in our notation here, some of you which maybe already visited lectures with us might know that this subscript index k means a sample time step. So yk would be the observation tuple y at the time step k. And we consider that the time involves in a discrete fashion. So if this loop has been conducted one time, we are at the time step k plus 1. If we loop over it a second time, we are at the time step k plus 2, and so on. So therefore, we work on discrete time problems, which for those which maybe have already visited control engineering lectures, is of course different from continuous time problems, where at every arbitrary time, step, time value, I can make a controller action. But here, in this sense, I only have the opportunity to decide for a new action every k time step on a discrete time grid. Yeah, sequential data stream, I've already mentioned this. This is also different from other machine learning problems like supervised machine learning, where normally you have already the data at hand and you can try to do something with the data, which is there as a data set. But here, of course, the data evolves and the data you receive also depends on the controller actions and on the agent actions, right? So if the agent tries to um, go out of this maze in a specific way, its position inside this maze will depend on its previous actions, right? So the data you receive regarding the response of the system on your actions will be depending on the actions itself. So it's basically a dependent problem where the data stream, the future data stream, will depend on your current and past actions and decisions. That is different from other machine learning problems where the data set is there. You can then play around with the data, try to fit models or whatsoever. But in this case, you have to do everything on the fly, right? So data is coming in, you have to process the data, you have to change your decision ways, and then, bam, come to the next decision. That's the special case about your reinforcement learning. It is all about sequential decision making. New information, try to process this information, try to 
make better decisions, make your decision, and then see how this is going on and on and on. Okay. So what is happening in every time step, just to go at least one time formally through this loop. So at every time step k, the agent will pick an action. So in this environment, basically, it could be like go left, go right, go forward, go backward. That could be, for example, a controller action in this maze. Then based on this, we will receive an observation and a reward. So that is basically what the agent gets at every time step. It will have an action and it will receive as a response the observation of the states and the reward indicating how good or well that was. From the viewpoint of the environment, of course, the thing is basically reversed. The environment receives an action UK. It will respond with a new observation, which is sensed here by the interpreter, and emits especially a reward, which is indicating if that is good or bad. This emitting of the reward, of course, we have to discuss this later on, if the reward um, design and the reward calculation can be considered either a part of the environment or a part of the agent. Um, to give you an example, um, if you want to um, learn an agent which is able to uh, play a computer game in an optimal fashion in order to receive a high score, then of course the reward, the high score at the end of the game, is emitted by the environment, by the computer which has a simulation of this game, right? On the other side, if you try to solve this autonomous car problem, the car itself will not give you any reward, right? It maybe goes, uh, um, basically can fail or something, but you will not get a mathematical function, which is something like a reward. And therefore, in this case, the re reinforcement learning agent would need to be equipped by a reward function which you, as a control designer, need to come up with. So in this case, we can um, philosophically consider the reward function either a part of the environment or a part of the reinforcement learning agent uh, itself, depending on the application. Yeah, remark on time, I've already mentioned this, so we will only work on discrete time steps, and for the sake of simplicity, we will also assume that the time between two time steps will be a uh, fixed time interval, so between two time steps there will be a delta time delta t, which is constant. This is, uh, for many reinforcement learning problems, not really important, to be honest. But as we will also do a lot of control engineering kind of problems, having a fixed time step delta t normally helps in order to ensure that the um, system response is somehow deterministic. In the subsequent lecture parts of today, we're going then to discuss also more on detail these different parts, observations, interpreter, state, environment, action, and agent. So this is basically the first viewpoint on it. We will add more details to these different terms later on today. But just to give you a first impression, what reinforcement learning is basically about, about sequential decision making and improving decision such that this reward becomes higher and higher over time as this is indicating how well you perform in a given task. Are there any questions so far regarding this loop? Everything unclear with it? Okay, cool. Um, good. Then reinforcement learning, just a very small kind of um, formal viewpoint on terminology. So reinforcement learning, of course, consists out of two words, reinforcement and learning. So reinforcement basically comes mostly from the field of psychology. We will not have here lectures on psychology, I can already say that. But just to give you some idea what reinforcement learning uh, actually means. And reinforcement, as the first part of the sentence is, a consequence applied that will strengthen an organism's future behavior whenever that behavior is preceded by a specific antecedent stimulus. There are four types of reinforcement, positive, negative reinforcement, extinction, and punishment. So positive reinforcement, I think that's the most obvious thing. If there's a certain behavior your agent should do in the future more often, 
then you give a positive reward to the agent, so basically a reward which is indicating good behavior. Negative reinforcement, uh, reinforcement then basically is more or less the inverse. If you see a behavior which is not appreciated, then of course you give a negative reward when this happens. Extinction is basically a special case. This is basically something like ignoring. So if there is behavior which you do not appreciate, but you believe that this behavior will vanish over time if you ignore it, then this would be extinction. An example from this would be uh, basically a dog. So if the dog barks at you all the time because he or she wants food, then you just ignore the dog for 10 minutes and he or she will become basically silent because you ignore it, and this would be an example of extinction. And yeah, punishment, of course, is basically obviously also clear. If you have any behavior which you do not appreciate, then you give a penalty for this. So therefore, um, these are the four classical forms of reinforcement uh, from a psychological point of view. But of course, we will see that later on, uh, psychology doesn't really matter in this context of uh, our course here, but we, has o we only have one reward function which we can basically shape indicating behavior of the agent which we would like to appreciate. Then we have a second term in reinforcement learning and this is learning. Learning could be defined as acquiring knowledge and skills and having them readily available from memory so you can make sense of future problems and opportunities. So that basically refers to this data-driven kind of concept, which I've already mentioned, that we try to process data which we obtain by interacting with our environment and trying to make our future decisions better in such a sense that our rewards will be increased. And this is a... Um, important point is here especially that we use memory. So that memory means that we will store data somewhere, normally of course on some hard disk or something like that, and then process this data over time. That is different from planning problems or model predictive control, which we will discuss later on, where normally you do not store past information, like what controller actions did I perform in the past, but you utilize a model in order to plan ahead from your current point of time without considering previous control actions. So in this case, that would be basically planning ahead without utilizing past information. And reinforcement learning is basically exactly the opposite. We just try to optimize our actions by utilizing past knowledge, our experience from the past, without utilizing a model of the environment trying to plan ahead, right? So therefore, reinforcement learning is basically utilizing from what you have observed the last weeks, days, or what else, trying to utilize this knowledge and make it better in the future. So something like intuitive decisions, we could also call it, right? So shaping your decisions from the past and then being able to do instantaneous decisions nowadays. I've also, of course, mentioned that reinforcement learning is one of the three pillars of machine learning. Um, this would be here our third pillar, learn optimal controller actions or optimal decisions to maximize the long-term reward. What this formally means, we will also see this later. In reinforcement learning, there are of course many notions, for example, single agent or multi-agent kind of problems. We are only going to discuss the simple case, the single agent problem. So that means that we have one agent which is making centralized decisions. A classical multi-agent problem would be a distributed control problem. For example, if you have a distributed energy system with different generators, batteries, or whatsoever, then every of these generators, batteries, and so on could have a local controller which has local decisions, and then you have many agents in this energy system. Also a very interesting problem, but goes beyond what we will discuss in the course. So we will have one agent sitting there, having overview about the entire system and making centralized decisions at one point. Other pillars of uh, machine learning, you hopefully already know them, at least uh, on a high level, unsupervised learning and supervised learning. In both cases, and I think that's the, the most important um, limitation or the most important difference to reinforcement learning is that in the case of supervised machine learning and unsupervised learning, 
normally we consider that a data set is already sitting somewhere and we analyze this data set in an offline fashion. So in supervised machine learning, we normally try to fit a model or do some classification task or what else. In unsupervised machine learning, we try to find some patterns in the data and stuff like that. But it's basically some kind of offline decision making or offline kind of data processing based on the full knowledge about the full data set. In reinforcement learning, this is an ongoing process. It's about sequential. Um, decision making without having the knowledge about um, the future data stream, but just about the current data and the past data. So this is basically the big uh, difference. And of course, um, decision making as a task for itself is also different from um, unsupervised and supervised learning in the sense that when you have a classification or regression, re regression task in supervised machine learning, this is of course not like really Decision making, this is making like a model or something which we can consider a model. So therefore, from a control engineering point of view, I would say these two things are based on some kind of building a model. And this guy would be making a controller, a decision making device. However, we will see that inside reinforcement learning, especially in the later parts of the course, not today, but in a few weeks from now, that uh, unsupervised and supervised machine learning parts will become important for reinforcement learning. So we, for example, see that very famous uh, deep Q learning networks, a very famous reinforcement learning agent um, software will basically have a central part of supervised machine learning in its core. It's not very um, high supervised machine learning kind of problems, but there are elements also from the other domains in reinforcement learning. So that's why we will also have a little excursion on the basics of supervised and unsupervised machine learning in lecture number seven or eight. So therefore, first contrast which we have to make here, okay, reinforcement learning comes from machine learning, but it is classically not considered unsupervised or supervised machine learning. Then another limitation which we should consider is um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. So artificial intelligence is anything where we try to mimic cognitive functions which are classically associated with humans. And of course, if we are discussing decision making in that sense that we try to make optimal decisions given a certain task, this kind of decision making is a classical human skill, a classical human characteristic. And therefore, reinforcement learning is a classical part of artificial intelligence methods. Personally, I do not really like to utilize this terminology in the context, especially here of our course, and in the context of most reinforcement learning problems, because as we can see, the underlying mathematics are basically so straightforward, and also the solutions which come out of this, that I would find it too much to say this is like something like an artificial intelligence, because you can really say, okay, like this is a mathematical kind of construct which you know puts out numbers right and we interpret these numbers as decisions or whatsoever but this is nothing which i personally would call artificial intelligence but formally um, as we mimic cognitive functions so making decisions it would be part of it machine learning we have already discussed that it's definitely a part of machine learning uh, in that sense that it's about algorithms which can try to modify themselves we will also see that this is a very important part of reinforcement learning because our way, how we make decisions, we call this policy as we will see later, this policy will involve over time. So for an example, when uh, you learn to drive, right, your initial policy might be to be very safe. You do not want to drive with 150 kilometers an hour over the German Autobahn because you might not know how to steer the car but you maybe just want to start not driving faster than like 30 kilometers per hour. You'd be like on the safe side of something is happening. And then over time you adapt your policy, right? So after two or three weeks of training, you are maybe more self-confident and now you have other kind of self-confidence and you drive faster. So you have changed your policy over time. So you have adapted your own decision-making rules. And this adaptivity to change yourself to change the algorithm which makes decisions for yourself if we are doing reinforcement learning based on mathematical tooling, 
This is a central concept of machine learning, in particular of reinforcement learning. And yeah, deep learning, this needs to be also discussed if what we are doing here is deep learning or deep reinforcement learning. I can definitely say that the first seven to eight weeks will be no deep learning at all, really like shallow learning at the surface, because we will not even touch artificial neural networks or something. We will need them later on, but in the first seven or eight lectures, this is like nothing which we will call deep learning, but tabular learning, so using lookup tables. Later on, when we use function approximators like artificial neural networks, the question is how big, how large, how long is this artificial neural network? There's not really a very strong definition, like so and so many neurons, so and so many parameters must be in the neural network to consult, uh, consider it like a deep reinforcement uh, or a deep learning model. But we will see that in control engineering and technical engineering, which we will consider mostly during this lecture, that most of the models which we will use have only a few neurons, a few layers, and is anything but deep. So therefore, although we are using machine learning models as part of the reinforcement learning solution later on, like artificial neural networks, these are normally small artificial neural networks, and therefore, I would not really call it deep reinforcement learning, right? So also, if you maybe read papers later on, and maybe we also have some paper recommendations for you through the lecture course, um, really have a sharp eye on this if what the authors call deep learning is really deep learning because it's like really a trend that everyone who publishes anything about machine learning calls this like deep learning and then you go through the paper and say, okay, they have used an artificial neural network with two layers and 100 neurons per layer and you go, okay, like these are maybe, I don't know, 10,000 parameters or something like that. That's nothing. So therefore, make up your mind if deep learning is really... Uh, a term which fits to the solution which we discussed. Okay, so therefore, we are in the domain of artificial intelligence, practically machine learning, and potentially we will also see some deep learning problems. Therefore, reinforcement learning as a subject is really a broad subject. We could have viewpoints from different uh, angles, like already mentioned from psychology or neuroscience, where colleagues from these fields try to explain decision-making in humans and animals. That they try to use reinforcement learning concepts, trying to explain how does a human, how does an animal make a decision. Also very interesting, but nothing which we will discover here in this course. Our viewpoint will be like these viewpoints, engineering, computer science, and mathematics. So we try to use basically mathematical tools in order to solve engineering and also some yeah, simple computer science kind of problems, which are not directly related to engineering, in order to come up with optimal decisions in technical or technical related tasks. So this will be our viewpoint, which we will utilize on reinforcement learning. Also very important, that if you're looking up for reinforcement learning uh, alternative lectures or research papers, you should have also these different viewpoints in the back of your mind. There might be people from the domain of biology or medicine or whatsoever, which also do reinforcement learning, but like from a completely different perspective because they use it in the context of psychology, neuroscience, and so on. But we are here in engineering department, so that's why we will have a strong emphasis on this branch here. Okay. Um, that was already everything I wanted to discuss regarding reinforcement learning on a very general level. So takeaway messages are we do sequential decision making. We try to find optimal decisions with automated algorithms. How we do this, of course, the details will come in the next weeks. Um, and it's a machine learning domain kind of problem. Anything unclear so far to this point? Seems to be not the case. Good. Then um, let's go from, through some history and also some examples. And the examples will be fun because we will have two or three videos. Um, so reinforcement learning basically really goes back uh, already uh, more than 100 years to Pavlov, uh, which was basically one of these psychology guys 
You may know from uh, school the Pavlov dogs experiment, where he basically showed like treats and things like that, dogs, and see how they, um, what's the English term for that? Like, basically, how, how, how they, um, yeah, how the water came out of their mouth when they had been uh, treated with a, a very nice uh, treat. Um, and he basically have found out that by classical conditioning, so by basically positive and negative reinforcement learning, you can try to change the behavior of animals, persons, and so on. So he was basically laying the foundations in terms of reinforcement for animals and human beings. However, of course, this is not the viewpoint which we will take. We will take more like a mathematical engineering kind of viewpoint. And here things become very interesting with Andrei Markov. He was a Russian mathematician, which have sponsored us the lecture of next week, which are the Markov decision processes. So this guy basically laid the foundation about uh, problems, the Markov decision problems, uh, which we will utilize as a baseline for reinforcement learning problems. And these are, as we will see, basically stochastic processes where also random impacts can play an important role. So this is also interesting for reinforcement learning, that we do not make any assumptions regarding deterministic or stochastic problems. Everything, mostly everything, which we will discuss during the next weeks, is applicable to problems which are of deterministic source or stochastic source. Because the framework on which we build everything up, and these are the Markov decision processes, are stochastic processes, and therefore, deterministic problems are just a subset out of that. So very nice. And then um, there's Richard Bellman. You can also look them up, or he. You can also look him up on the internet if you like. Didn't found a free picture of him, but he was basically a, a U.S. American mathematician slash engineer, uh, and he was he will sponsor us the uh, lecture in two weeks, dynamic programming, because he basically worked out the tools in order to solve the problems with Markov came up with. And we will see that the Bellman principle of optimality and the Bellman um, kind of, of problem solving way will be very important for all subsequent uh, solutions which are based on data-driven learning. So dynamic programming by Richard Bellman is actually not a data-driven kind of approach, it's a model-based approach. But we will see that the framework of which he came up with is very generalizable to also general problems uh, in the machine learning context which we have here. In terms of history, I do not want to bother you with like a history talk today, like, okay, in this year this happened, and in this year this happened, so we will skip this. Um, I've basically here on this uh, sheet for you just give you like uh, some recommendations if you're interested after class or during the Easter holiday to read a little bit for yourself. Uh, in the book of Bartow Sutton, there's chapter 1.7, they really give a very nice overview about the field, how it evolved from the basic mathematical viewpoints in the 60s and 70s, when they did not really had any computers or nearly any computers to solve problems in a data-driven kind of process like we are able today, and then how the field evolved up to now with uh, big computational resources available in form even from laptops or high-performance computing clusters. Uh, Bato also gave a very nice talk, I think two or three years ago, um, which is available as a YouTube video, um, which is here available as a link, you can click on this. And here are yeah, one paper which is more like a little bit historic, but also two more recent papers, which give you also a very nice uh, overview about the field in terms of research. So um, if, for example, you want to do a thesis in this field, or if you want to do like a project seminar in this field, these papers can give you good references to other papers in the field of different sub-problems. So therefore, this is more like a reminder sheet for you later on after class, or when you do, like as I said, a project or thesis in this area, you can have a look and uh, therefore find more appropriate material. Ah. Applications. So let's go to maybe two or three applications uh, where we can utilize reinforcement learning to solve problems. Uh, a very classical problem. Um, so all of these links here, you can click them uh, as they are YouTube links. Okay, that's very small. <laughs> 
So one classical example uh, which we have here is uh, basically the swing up problem. Um, we actually also have one of these pendulums in our lab. Uh, is it starting? Yes, it's starting. So what is the task here is basically simple. Uh, we have a task problem, so basically a slider with this pole. Uh, we have two equilibrium points here. One equilibrium is, of course, the simple equilibrium where the rod is facing downward, and the second equilibrium where the uh, rod is facing upwards. And the task here is basically to learn how to find a controller policy such that just from interacting with this pendulum, we can learn to swing up the pendulum to the upward position and then to stabilize it there. Um, you can see that at the very beginning of the training phase, this is not really successful, right? It's just like swinging a little bit, but this is nothing close to uh, doing the swing up. And yeah, after 25 trials, things get a little bit more like interesting. Uh, maybe I can speed this up. So here, after 180 trials, we see, aha, the swing up was successful. Doesn't look so fancy yet, like a little bit shaky, uh, but yeah, it already goes in the right direction. So we can therefore see over time how gradually the reinforcement learning agent, the reinforcement learning software, which is in the background, can learn how to do this task, right? And to be honest, uh, you will do the same here in the course. So we have exercises uh, for exactly this problem. So we will give you a simulation environment with such a card pool, and your task together with us, of course, is to provide algorithms, configure algorithms, and apply algorithms such that they can do exactly the same as we see here in the video. And if you're interested, we actually have uh, the same, or not exactly the same, but conceptually the same um, experiment in our lab. So if you like, you can also do this later on as a, a project or something like that in our lab in order to see all the problems which come from doing something in simulation and then try to do the same thing in reality. Because this simulation to reality gap is really like, it's a big thing. So, and you just have to do it because then you will learn where the problems are. Especially if somebody like me comes with a stick and hits against it. So, and then the adversarial. Um, so this is basically a fun problem. Um, another problem which I would just like show you very briefly is a problem which we actually solved in our lab ourselves. Uh, of course, our department, we are basically like uh, control engineers for uh, power systems. And what we have used so far is, uh, we have used reinforcement learning algorithms trying to come up with automated control solutions for power electronics and here an electrical drive. Uh, and normally if you set up like an electrical drive control system, an expert engineer needs a couple of days. And we have come up with a solution which basically learns, it's not so well visible here, how to do torque tracking with an electrical motor in less than five minutes, learning from scratch, uh, from zero to hero in five minutes, uh, which is very nice because this is faster than our coffee machine was able to fill up this coffee pot with coffee. So it's very nice that in this example, we had been able to outsource the work of the human, which you would need to make tediously to a computer algorithm, and therefore we can save the time in order to drink some coffee or have a snack with that. And actually, you will also learn how to do this. So we will also have an example for you uh, where you will get a um, problem of how to control an electrical drive system, a simple one, um, and you will then learn how to do torque, speed, and current tracking of this kind of motor which normally you need to have knowledge about the motor or physics, you have knowledge about control engineering, you need to know about constraints and so on. But here in our uh, example, which we provide to you, you can basically learn this from scratch without having knowledge about these different things. And I feel that this is really one of the interesting uh, opportunities of reinforcement learning that Controller algorithms and automation software can try to learn tasks which are of everyday routine and can therefore speed up things which have to be done very often in industry and therefore also which currently still utilize a lot of human labor. For example, uh, going back to this electrical drive system problem, 
Electrical drives and power electronics are like really everywhere, right? So uh, in industry, in any production plants, there are hundreds and thousands of electrical, power electronical uh, uh, voltage sources or current sources, drives and so on. So if you want to come up with control algorithms for all these difficult systems, you really need like large engineering departments which will design these controller algorithms and so on. And this is tedious and takes time. And if we have some control algorithm maker, so in reinforcement learning software, which can spit out an interesting and high performance controller in no time, the people which are still currently working on this controller design problem nowadays can save that time and do something which is maybe more challenging. So this is a very interesting thing about reinforcement learning, that we can automate things. Um, there are many more things uh, where we can apply reinforcement learning. I do not go through them now uh, because of time. Uh, you can, of course, just click them through and have uh, some fun videos. But I think what also comes out from the summary here is that reinforcement learning is also a very generalizable tool. We have classical engineering problems like electrical drive systems or balancing a car pole or driving cars, but we also have like games, Atari or board games. We have very fancy things like uh, nuclear fusion reactor control, a uh, very recent paper from uh, Deep uh, uh, Mind from last year. Or also, of course, you maybe already use it, ChatGPT. I've also had some oral exams a couple of uh, days back and one student said to me, okay, this and this is my answer to your question. And I asked him, okay, interesting answer, but this doesn't have to do anything with my question. How do you know this? And his answer was, yeah, ChatGPT told me this. So uh, it's not everything good, what the tool says. Uh, but basically, ChatGPT under the hood is a reinforcement learning algorithm. So you will also learn the fundamentals of how ChatGPT is trained. Of course, it's basically a PPO algorithm. That is one algorithm which we will um, learn at the very end of lecture number 13, I guess. Okay, and therefore, I think this should be really the, the takeaway message here from this slide. Uh, reinforcement learning is a universal tool in order to make optimal decisions in a large set of heterogeneous applications. It can be engineering, it can be games, it can be chatbots, it can be really like everything where you said, I have to make a decision what to do next. And if this is a problem you encounter, you can use reinforcement learning. That's a very nice thing. Okay, so I would like to do, I think, how many slides more? Just four, five slides more, and then we will have a little break uh, as announced, and then we will have the second part after the break. So basic terminology, that basically means that we will go through again through this optimization loop, which we saw agent, environment, interpreter with action, state, reward, observations, and so on. So we will now go through this loop again and discuss all of these parts. Uh, some of them will be formally defined by mathematical definitions also, and we will add a little bit more details to this loop, okay? Um, the first thing which I would like to discuss is the reward. The reward is super important, um, and the reward is basically a scalar random variable. Scalar means at every time step k, you get a scalar quantity, just one of them, which indicates how good you or your agent, which you have programmed, is doing. So everything which you need to evaluate what you consider good or bad behavior must be fitted into the single reward, right? So if you're trying to drive a car, like hitting a tree, hitting a pedestrian, or nicely driving inside the, the um, streets, this must be mapped into this reward signal. Because this is the only kind of information which we will utilize later on in order to learn what is good or bad. So therefore, everything has to go there. Um, normally, it can be some real number. Maybe it's also an integer. Um, but with real numbers, of course, except for complex numbers, we have, of course, the largest scope. 
Um, the reward function or the interpreter may be naturally given or needs to be designed. I've already mentioned an example. If we want to learn how to um, play a game, if you get a high score from this game at the end, this would be like a natural, natural reward in that sense. We want to play this game in such a way that we're able to boost the high score and the high score would be somehow a very clear, natural kind of reward indicating how good we have learned how to play the game. However, for most other things, car driving, controlling power electronics, controlling this pendulum, there is no reward function. Therefore, the reward design needs to be done by you. So that's why I've mentioned previously, there is somehow a philosophical debate if you consider the reward part of the environment or part of the agent, because for many practical problems, there is no reward function. You, as an engineer, need to come up with a suitable reward function, which is indicating how good or how bad an agent is doing. So that also means that you need to transfer expectations, um, requirements, and so on, regarding the system behavior into this reward function. Because the reward, as I said, is the only input point for you to provide information to the agent what is what the agent is doing good or bad so therefore reward design is actually not trivial and can be a considerable source of error in that sense that if you have a bad reward design you maybe are not able to learn something but there's a question yes Okay, so excellent question. So the reward distribution over time, basically, right? Um, you do not need to have a reward greater or lower than zero at every time step, right? So if you have chess, for example, as you said, you could either do not provide any rewards until the end of the game where you know, okay, opponent one or opponent two has won. And, and until, until the final step, you basically just give zero, zero, zero rewards. Or you could try to formulate a reward function, which also tries to evaluate intermediate scenarios, right? That you say, okay, like the chess game situation is currently like such and such. And this might be a very good situation for opponent one and not so good for opponent two, right? So this would be then also the question is how do I process problems where the reward is just at the very end. However, we will see already in two weeks from now that the reinforcement learning algorithms are basically able to backtrack information through time. So if you see that your reward is just being produced, so to say, at the end of the problem, like chess, then the algorithms will be able to backtrack which decision had which um, contribution to having this reward. At least we try to do this. It will be not like an exact science, but there will be algorithms which will try basically to backtrack this and therefore trying to modify not only the last step, of course, of our controller decisions, but all previous steps as well. Okay, but good question. Um, yeah, it fully indicates how well an agent is doing a time step case. So I've said you need to squeeze in everything like that. And uh, the reward is also very important regarding the reward hypothesis. What does that mean? That basically means that we need to formally state what I've already described, that the idea is that every agent tries to maximize the expectation over the rewards uh, in the future. So here, if we add time step k, and we have future steps k plus i, then these future steps should be done in such a way, the action should be done in such a way, that the agent gets maximum reward over time. Right? This is the hypothesis. I think it's a trivial hypothesis. It becomes clear. 
that already the reward or reinforcement learning term is indicating. We want to maximize this, but this is now the formal definition of what our actual goal is. This should be maximized. We will see that we will do a little modification to this reward hypothesis just in a couple of minutes. But basically, this is our goal, formal goal. Try to find actions such that the future reward or the expectation over the future rewards is maximized. And of course, this is an interesting problem in that sense that we said, okay, we can only do one decision at a time at every time step k. But that also then means from this reward hypothesis point of view that we have to learn to do decisions in the long run, right? So it's not only about making an intermediate decision, yes, but this decision must be also a wise decision in the long run. So there's also a temporal component to it that sometimes it might be good to sacrifice an instantaneous high reward in order to obtain in the long run better rewards than in the short-sighted kind of problem. Right? So for example, um, in a race, it could be interesting to use a shortcut. For example, if you have like a sailing race or something like that, it might be interesting to take a longer route, which might, of course, give you then short-sightedly a lower reward because you, you basically increase the distance to your goal where you want to arrive with your ship. But maybe on this route, the winds are better for you so that your sailing ship can speed up and therefore maybe overtake other ships which go the smaller route. So therefore, it would be maybe wise to do other controller actions if you're looking long term in contrast to short term. OK, so what are a few reward examples? Um, so if you're flipping a pancake with your pen, of course, positive reward would be that you're able to catch the pancake after it has been rotated in the air by 180 degrees. And if your pancake drops on the floor, you might give a negative reward. Stock trading. So that would be actually another example of a natural reward, I would call it, in that sense that um, if you want to make decisions when to buy which stock, uh, stocks from the market, so stock shares, of course, the amount of money in your broker portfolio, this is somehow a natural reward, right? You want to maximize the money which you have obtained from good investments in the past. Therefore, this amount of money in your broker portfolio, this is basically your kind of reward, right? So therefore, a very natural reward kind of thing here again. Playing Atari games, also natural reward. We have mentioned that high score value at the end of the game. Driving an autonomous car. Positive reward, getting safe from A to B without crashing in anything. Negative reward, obviously, if you have an, some kind of an accident. Classical control, like electrical drives, inverted pendulum, as we have seen in the videos. So positive reward if you are able to track a given reference, like the swing up of the pendulum, or if you are violating any system constraints. So for example, if the um, controller is crashing into the barriers of this pendulum rod, which we have seen, positively indicating some technical harm to the system, that would be then something which we indicate, of course, negative reward. These are, of course, just high-level descriptions of good rewards, negative rewards. And of course, uh, one challenge would it be then to formalize these kind of uh, reward examples and more clearly in a very uh, concise reward function, which can be then learned by the reinforcement learning agent. Um, also, rewards can have many different flavors um, in that sense. So therefore, we have already discussed that actions may have short or long-term consequences in that sense that in a board game, um, of course, um, if you do the initial chess game moves, you do not really know how this will then result in the long term in terms of the situation on the board. So therefore, there might be delays between actions and rewards. However, the good thing is that we will see that the general reinforcement learning context is generalizable to these delays. Reward can have positive and real negative values. We have already discussed that. And there might be also stochastic impacts to the rewards. 
right? So um, you are operating, or the controller agent is operating in stochastic environments. And for example, if you're flying in a helicopter, or you should learn how to fly in a helicopter, and at some point there is, I don't know, a thunderstorm approaching or whatsoever, and the helicopter, you know, breaks down, of course, this is something like an exogenous stochastic kind of impact, which you do not able to control. You cannot control the wind. But of course, if the helicopter goes down and crashes, reward will be still negative, right? So therefore, stochastic influences needs to be also considered when come up with controller policy. Yeah, and therefore, as I've already mentioned, the learning process is heavily linked with the reward distribution. And there is actually no lecture book or something like that, which I could present to you, which will pro uh, provide you clear advice how to formulate the best reward function. So there are actually uh, many ways how to design a reward function, to be honest. And in some cases, it's more like arts than science. So as this is the same kind of an empirical problem, sometimes you just need to try it out and see what is happening. And over time, especially also with our examples, which we provide you through the exercises, we hope that you get a good indication, a good intuition, how to design at least reward functions which will work. I would like to also give you a very um, intuitive kind of a reward failure kind of thing, uh, example, um, with respect to this inverted pendulum problem. So in this inverted pendulum problem, we had our pendulum track with the card and the pole, maybe with some weight on it. Here is x min and here is x max. So this would be the, the card with the pendulum rod and maybe some mass m, length l is not so important. And the card can now move left and right on this lateral axis here. If the card hits x min or x max, so the natural barriers of the lateral axis, the system would shut down due to safety, right? Because if you hit a constraint, you should shut down just for safety reasons. So the task would be now to stabilize this pendulum, assuming that the pendulum is already here in, in close to upward position. And you need to design a reward function indicating that if the controller agent is able to stay upwards, that this is indicating the behavior which we would like to do. And I would have um, two rewards for you, which might could do the job. The first reward, which I would like to propose, I call it R1 would be minus absolute value of alpha. Makes sense, right? So if alpha, yeah, that's a little, now it fits. So if alpha is zero, this minus would be zero. And if alpha is anything but zero, then of course alpha would get, uh, a positive or negative number with the absolute value, it's of course getting a positive number, but then we have this minus in front. So therefore, the, the best possible reward of this agent can be only here at this point, right? Does anyone see the problem if I would utilize this reward and apply a reinforcement learning algorithm which tries to do reward maximization. What could happen? Yeah, but of course, it's not also so really important, right? So if it's like jiggling around here, I would say that's fine. What could also happen? So you want to maximize the reward, right, over time, in the long term. That maximum is always zero. 
But what could then learn, especially if the reinforcement learning controller needs to, you know, just get acquainted to the system and needs to find out what might be better decisions than just doing random actions here to the card? It would be not staying at zero, but the interesting point you've mentioned are these boundary constraints here. So what could happen is that the agent learns when it hits one of these barriers, the system will basically deactivate itself, and after that there will be no further rewards, right? So every reward after hitting one of these constraints will be zero as well. So with this reward kind of problem, you wouldn't have basically built a suicide controller. <laughs> it looks good, like, yeah, okay, if alpha is zero, then we stay up. But of course, until the agent has really learned to do this very nice stabilization, it maybe has also found out that if you crash into one of these barriers, all your future rewards will be also zero. Good. Nice, so I will kill myself. <laughs> a better idea would be maybe the reward function two, where we say, okay, we would like to have something like a positive reward, which could be the cosine from alpha, right? So if alpha is zero, cosine of zero would be one. If we leave this position around zero, the cosine would get less than one, and even if the pendulum completely, you know, goes in this direction, it would get at least uh, not worse than minus one. But by this, you basically have something like a positive kind of reward. If you also would like to ensure that it's not getting negative, we could also add an offset to it by plus one, then the reward would be always positive. But in that sense, if the controller would see that it can crash against these boundaries, it would just get zero rewards from there on, which is inferior than at least getting some reward, which is still positive, right? So this would be like a staying alive kind of reward, and this would be the suicide controller, okay? So therefore, also this uh, very interesting uh, quote from Norbert Wiener, mathematician from USA, uh, the reward function grants you what you asked for, not what you have should ask for, right? So this is like really a very classical example to show um, that a reward definition which you come up with in the very first instant doesn't have to be the best possible reward signal. It's unfortunately not trivial, and as mentioned, you also need to, you know, Empirically, uh, learn it a little bit, uh, but over time, things will become much more clearer. Okay, two more slides before the break. Um, the reward, uh, which we have seen as, uh, for now, is of course of uh, vital importance, but the reward will be handled in two different ways, depending on how we will operate. And one operation mode differentiation, which we can uh, ask for, is task dependency in that sense that we might have episodic task or, as we will see just in a second, continuing task. With episodic tasks, we refer to tasks which have a natural end and restart again. So playing a game like chess or Atari, you have an episode which would mean we start the game from scratch and we play until somebody won or you have solved all levels. Game ends, game restarts, new episode. So this would be like an episodic kind of problem. Right? You always start back from some initial state, you have a limited number of steps and then naturally the so-called episode terminates and then you have basically a reset of your environment. That would be an episodic problem. And therefore, our time steps, which we consider, are limited uh, by up to n points. And therefore, the so-called return 
the return in this case would be the sum of the rewards which we can um, gather until this final time step would be a finite sum, right? Because we have only a finite number of time steps which we have available to obtain rewards and then the episode comes to an end and then everything starts from scratch. So we have just this time amount in order to do something. And in contrast to this, which uh, often takes place in classical control engineering, you might also have continuing tasks where you do not have a natural kind of end where the environment restarts itself. So if you have, for example, a chemical process plant where you do refining of fuels or refining of uh, chemical elements, these processes normally they, you know, they take weeks, months, or some of them are just working for years. So there's nothing like a natural end to this process. And in this sense, the reward would come continuously without any natural end as an infinite series. That would be a continuing task without a clear episode end. And the problem, of course, is if the series would go for infinitely many steps, if you add up rewards, which are either in average positive or negative, this would become an infinite sum, right? So we sum up something up which is positive or negative for infinitely many times. So the return, so the sum of the rewards would completely go through the roof. And in order to prevent this, what we normally work with is the so-called discounting. Discounting is something not what you get from a German discounter like Aldi or Lidl, but like a mathematical discount in that sense that we say, okay, for every time step, we consider a discount rate, which we introduce here as gamma, which is between zero and one. And therefore, our future rewards are discounted with this discount rate gamma. And we will see on the next slide uh, various um, interpretations of how can we interpret this discount rate in practical means. But as you hopefully already see from the slide, the discount rate or discount factor will especially allow us to um, come up with a return, so with the discounted sum of rewards, which is still limited, although we have infinitely many sums in our series. And this is actually our modified reward hypothesis, that we do not want to only maximize the sum of returns or the expectation of the sum of the rewards, but potentially also the discounted sum of rewards. Last slide before the break, uh, discounts. How can we interpret this? So, of course, there's a numerical viewpoint, which I've already mentioned. If gamma is smaller than one, we have the geometric series expression, which will always deliver us a bounded return. So, therefore, we can bound the number to an, yeah, a real bounded one. There might be also a strategic interpretation. Discounting, of course, means that if the discount is smaller than one, if you multiply this gamma to the power of two, to the power of three, to the power of four, and so on, the factor will decrease, right, if gamma is smaller than one. So this will basically mean that the rewards which we get more far in the future will be less important to us than the rewards which we will become in the short timeline, right? So this would be also a hyperparameter or configuration parameter of our problem definition. That we say, okay, if we have a problem where the discount factor is very small, then this seems to be a problem where we are very greedy because we want to have instantaneous rewards, we want to have a short-sighted agent and not one which is like long-sighted. Could be some kind of a trading strategy, right? So if you need money now, gamma goes down because you need the money now, not in 10 years. If you have, a, you know, time in order to make stock trading and you do not need the rewards, like your, your investments back from the, from the bank, like now, you could give uh, gamma to something closely to one and therefore you would create a problem and could apply an agent to it, which is more like far-sighted. 
yeah, mathematical options, it's more or less just uh, the numerical viewpoint once again. So if gamma is smaller than one, this return, so the series of discounted rewards, assuming that we have some constant positive or negative reward, becomes a bounded value because we can rewrite this with the geometric series and the geometric series is existing at limiting once gamma is smaller than one. So this is therefore the numerical trick that although we might have problems where we gather rewards over long time steps, that if you would just, you know, sum up all these rewards without discounting, the numbers would get very large, which could be also numerically problematic. Discounting can help us to keep these numbers bounded and work with them. So therefore we have different viewpoints on discounting, which can have a strategic viewpoint and a, and a mathematical numerical viewpoint. And we will see that these returns, which we'll call them G here, will become also very important, uh, not only today, but also for the upcoming weeks, in order to build agents which will actually maximize these return numbers. Okay, any questions to the reward so far? Suraj. Um, yeah, sure, but at this point, so if we have a look at the return series, so let's say your next time step will be the one where the reward really goes in the seller. Of course, at this time step, you will notice that there was a negative reward, a very bad one, and then you can process this already, right? Of course, then if you have um, five, six, seven or more, more time steps, of course, this reward will be already way back and due to small discount factor, it will not have any large impact then anymore on our policy at this point. But at this particular time step where it occurs, of course, you will be able to process it and it will be able to change your decision-making policy. Other questions? Seems not the case. Okay, then I think it's a very good time for a break. Um, I would say we make 15 minutes break that you can catch some fresh air or have a drink or something. Uh, and then we will continue in yeah, a quarter before 4 p.m. And yeah, see you then. Thank you.